Yes, we need to change individually in terms of our patterns of consumption. We should consume less, and most importantly, we should consume intelligently. We should look into the products that we consume and see which ones have the highest carbon footprint. How can make a, a impact, a change in our uh, way we we live? Uh, this, maybe we waste too much energy in heating our houses. Maybe we use too much fossil fuels to refuel our cars. Uh, is there alternative technology are in our side to combat these climate disasters? Yes, we need to change individually in terms of our patterns of consumption. We should consume less, and most importantly, we should consume intelligently. We should look into the products that we consume and see which ones have the highest carbon footprint. And, you know, one of those is, of course, buying gasoline. Yes. And it's difficult for an individual to change the whole economy that's based on fossil fuels. Yes. But there are things that we can do. So we can, in some cases, uh, put photovoltaic panels on our homes. Mm -hmm. We can, through our utility companies, usually there's an option to purchase primarily green energy, that is renewable energy. Mm -hmm. We have that option with our utility company here in Northern Arizona. Um, so we need to make those choices to get away from the coal burning plants that generate our electricity. Mm -hmm. And we need to vote yes. so that the policies to switch to renewable energy can be strong and be acted upon quickly. Mm -hmm. Here in Northern Arizona, we just recently, in December, we took down the Navajo Generating Station, which was a big coal burning power plant just to the north of us here in Flagstaff. Um, this year, they're beginning to build a 477 megawatt wind power plant out That's at right. Chevlon Butte, which is just outside of Winslow, a little town just east of Flagstaff. So this will help us in a big way to be able to consume clean energy. Um, so there are many things we can do. I'm going to be, right now, my furnace went out. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> so things are cold. Oh, boy. But um, I'm not going to purchase a new gas furnace. Instead, I will purchase an electric furnace uh -huh. to replace the gas furnace that, that went. And um, this will be one way for me to reduce my carbon footprint. Um, I currently drive hybrid cars, but they're only you know, they're a small step in the right direction. They yeah. use a little bit less gas, but they still use gas. So my next car purchase will be an electric vehicle. That's great. And again, this is a good thing only if you have clean energy to use to charge your electric vehicle. So I'm really happy that that wind power plant is going in and that I will be able to heat my home with clean electricity and power my car with clean electricity. So, it, you know, it takes both the individual action, 
the choices that we make and the collective action to build new power plants because it's not an individual that does that, right? Yes. So that we have the choices to choose cleaner energy. Do you think there are good intentions to work with uh, all aspects of the policy, uh, uh, Republicans and Democratic? Uh, it's, it's time to yes, make some changes I, I, here. I feel like a weight has been taken off of me because in the last four years, we have been going in exactly the opposite direction of what we need to do. So I'm glad that already we have rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement. Yes. And already we are um, looking to do things like block the XL pipeline. Yes. And block further oil exploration in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and in the many of our national monuments. So, you know, I, I think that things are moving in the right direction and it is a big relief for me as a climate scientist, but also um, I think that we need to keep pressure on the current administration because what is required, if you look at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's recent reports, they're suggesting that we need to, if we want to avoid raising the Earth's temperature by 1.5 degrees centigrade, we want to avoid that. We have to reduce our emissions very, very rapidly. Yes. This is not going to be easy. It's really going to take a concerted effort of our government, of all the individuals, to reach the goals. The, the goals in the last IPCC report suggest we need to reach net zero emissions by the year 2040 or 2050 at the latest, if we yes. want to avoid that kind of rise in temperature. Um, to do that, it takes a huge change and it, it's, it's going to require all those kinds of things like converting our, getting rid of our coal fired power plants, mm -hmm. replacing them with wind power, which is cheaper also to produce. So that's, these will all be benefits as we shift to these new renewable technologies, not just in terms of climate change, but also economically. So both solar and wind power have been cheaper than every kind of fossil fuel production of electricity for at least the last seven years. And so it's high time that we make that switch to benefit our overall economy and our individual pocketbooks. <laughs> Why should we be paying extra to maintain the profits of the fossil fuel companies? We should not be doing that. We should not be subsidizing their destruction of the earth. We should no longer be funding them through our purchases. We need to shift individually and collectively. But remember, still the oil companies dominate the, the market and they are gonna fight back. They are gonna try to pressure politics in order to keep in business. But they, they have, have been also fighting the, back, yeah. Yeah, uh, already, yes, yes. Um, they, they have the money to transform or to switch to a clean energy. They have the investment. They could just keep the investment in the right direction where we are heading right now. They have the power. They have the money. They don't need to be sticking this fossil dinosaur era that we have. <laughs> um, it's amazing that uh, we are in the year 2021. Um, but I remember the 70s, the late 70s when there was an embargo, Iran, remember? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I remember very clear that uh, there was a shortage of oil, but at that point we didn't have alternatives, but now we have. We have a different solution, clean solution. And also I was reading about the, the most difficult, uh, the most difficult uh, way to change will be how to replace cement, how to replace steel. Those are the materials that we needed still, and we don't have a substitution for the production of this clean solution for the steel and cement. I heard about uh, also, uh, you might know better than me, it's about carbon capture. Um, first of all, we do know how to make steel using electricity. Uh -huh. So there is already a foundry in New England that uses 
purely electricity to produce steel. Mm -hmm. So we, there, you know, that's the rare exception. Most steel production is still done with fossil fuels, but we know how to do it with electricity. And it's just a matter of converting to that way of doing it. Uh, we, we also with cement. So cement is a big source of carbon that goes into the atmosphere. And most of that carbon comes from when we create the cement, um, there's a process uh, where we form clinker from the calcium carbonate rich raw materials, and it releases a lot of CO2. But there are also many companies who are working on alternatives to this kind of cement. And there's one of them is called um, uh, Biomason, and they have a product called BioBrick in which they use bacteria to quickly suck CO2 out of the atmosphere to produce the equivalent of a cement brick. They're working now on ways to, you know, one of the beauties of cement is that it's formable. You can pour it into a form and then have something that's the shape of that form. Well, they're working on ways to use this bacteria production of cement to be formable as well, so that they could pour the material into a form and then have cement that is in the shape of that form. So there are many people who are working on alternatives to both iron production, steel production, and cement. Mm -hmm. And these are really important things. Unfortunately, they're still, you know, at the small scale level. But if we have the right policies in place, we can take those technologies being developed and quickly convert them. In terms of your other question um, about carbon capture. Yes. There are, there are many ways that we can do this. And there was a review article in January of 2019 in Scientific American that evaluated all the different proposed ways that we could carbon capture. And uh, if you look at different ones, so there's biochar is one in which you take basically plant materials and you burn them under anaerobic, um, with very little oxygen mm -hmm. to produce charcoal. And that does reduce the carbon footprint a little bit, but we're still burning stuff. Yeah. So one of the best uses of that biochar actually is to put it into soil. And then basically you're adding more carbon to the soil. It enriches the soil because it has more sponge-like ability to hold water and it has more nutrients. Um, but overall, that's, that's probably not going to really take a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere. Yeah. Unless we did it at a large scale and then still we're still burning. Yeah. as part of it. Yeah. So I worry about it. One of the main ones that's just a positive win-win outcome is reforestation and afforestation. So that is regrowing the forests that we've cut mm -hmm. down mm -hmm. and growing new forests in areas where there weren't necessarily forests to begin with. Yes. Forests can capture and store a lot of carbon. Yes. It's not enough to take the two and a half trillion tons of CO2 that we've already put into the atmosphere out. But it's, if we did it year after year, it would contribute significantly to reducing that carbon in the atmosphere. We need other things though. It's not, it's not enough just to regrow the forests. So one thing that people are working on and evaluating is something called regenerative agriculture. Mm -hmm. And in regenerative agriculture, you put much of your biological waste, you know, when you grow wheat, there's the chaff from wheat that you could put back into the soil. These days, oftentimes it's not put back into the soil. Instead, it's just discarded or put into bales and used for other things. In any case though, we could be putting more of that carbon back into the soil. I know in Germany, um, I've seen farmers take those wastes 
and they put them in these um, cement bins mm -hmm. where they ferment for a few months. And then early in win uh, late in winter, early in spring, they put that biological material back into the soil. And their soils are black and rich, and you can smell them. And they smell, it smells healthy. <laughs> it's really, really good. Uh, but we need use so much of our industrial agriculture has just reaped all of the carbon from the soil. And when we, when we till the soil, we're adding oxygen into that soil and all the carbon that's stored in the soil breaks down faster and we're releasing a lot of carbon from our soils. We need to turn that around and yes. put more carbon back into our soils. And there are ways that, that there are ancient ways that we know how to do yeah. this. We need to go back to some of our older agricultural practices. Yeah, but we have the technology and we have a professional like you that bring with all these ideas of solutions and we don't have to just uh, uh, wait, just the solution are available right now. Yeah. Well, many people are testing these kinds of things. They're looking, they're evaluating just how much carbon can we store in the soils if we change this agricultural product yeah. practice or that agricultural practice. Other people have also suggested that we can grind up certain kinds of rocks, basalt, mm -hmm. mix them into the soils, and they themselves will take some carbon out of the atmosphere. Now, that the analysis of that is that it would be very expensive mm -hmm. to grind up the rock, transport it, and distribute it in the fields. And so, yes, it would capture some carbon, but the cost would be very, very prohibitive. Yes, yes. Um, in other cases, people have also, there's a company in Switzerland that has used uh, amine filters that can capture CO2 straight out of the atmosphere. And so the idea is you have a fan that blows air past these filters. It requires heat to remove the carbon from the filters. And then they pump that CO2 down deep down mm -hmm. where it combines with basalt rock and yes. crystallizes. Mm -hmm. So it's a way to capture the carbon and, and sequester it. Yeah. It's expensive though. Um, and the place where it's really worked is in Iceland. Mm -hmm. So they've used this in Iceland and they can use the waste heat from their geothermal plants mm -hmm. as the heat source. As a heat source, yeah. And as a way to drive the fans that blow the air past the filters. So if we don't have renewable energy, to power those fans, of course, you know, then it's more burning of fossil fuels. <laughs> If we have to use fossil fuels to generate the heat to remove the CO2 from the filters, then it's also more carbon footprint. So it depends on how we apply that technology. And then the other, the main problem, I think, with that kind of approach is that the atmosphere is huge. How can we take any significant portion of that atmosphere and blow it past a filter to take the CO2 out. That's a massive yes. project. Yes. So I think it will be very difficult. So there are those technologies, but so far I have not seen a way other than in Iceland, mm -hmm. I've not seen a way for it really to have a significant reduction of the carbon in the atmosphere. Yes, at least but, at, but many people are working on at, different at, least, at least we are right now, uh, two days ago, we are in the right direction. At least we are yes. <laughs> going in the right direction. And, and, and that's a relief. Uh, and I, I like that. I like the new government that's going to take measures, um, explain, and that's the idea of uh, invite you uh, to just reach people who are not aware and what is coming. And what is coming, it's a hope. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for, for, for scientific community, but for all of us that we have to be aware uh, what is coming in the next years. Sometimes it's tough, uh, right? But uh, there are people uh, right now are suffering like the migrants community or the refugees that uh, they have no choice. Yeah. Many people are suffering and it, it's more and more every year. Um, 
it, it, but you're talking about the change and that we need to be ready for the change. So we need to rethink our agricultural systems to be able to adapt to the new conditions. Mm -hmm. But also one of the things that's going to be a big change is that the fossil fuel companies are already plummeting in value. So if you haven't already divested from fossil fuels in your investments, you need to do it right now because the price is already plummeting. Some of the largest banks in the world have already pledged that they will no longer support, they will no longer lend money to fossil fuel projects. So there are many pressures now on the fossil fuel industry, despite all of their misinformation yes. propaganda campaigns, they are starting to decline. Yes. And they will decline more and more rapidly as the entire world follows the Paris Climate Agreement mm -hmm. and shifts to renewable energy. One of the problems of that is that we've been talking about agricultural issues, but yes. um, one of the problems of that shift is that so far the fossil fuel industry or the dinosaur technologies, as I'd like to call them, um, <laughs> They have, been holding, they have been holding us back from developing renewable energy sources. Countries like Germany and China and others have really been investing in renewable energy. So China is ready to supply the world with photovoltaic panels. Mm -hmm. They're ready to supply the world as we go through this transition with wind turbines. Mm -hmm. The United States has fallen behind because of the drag of the dinosaur technologies. And so we need to come back to the forefront of being the developers of new renewable energy technologies and build our infrastructure to supply ourselves and the world with these new technologies because this shift is coming and is going to be rapid. And the, le the less we're prepared for it, the more we will suffer economically yes. in the United States. Yes. You know, so it's the agricultural, it's the economic, it's, it's everything, and we need to embrace it. Yes, and participate and, and, and welcome new ideas and stop uh, thinking about how was our life uh, years or when we grew up. Uh, we are living in a different environment. Um, and don't be afraid of change. It's just going to happen. Uh, it's going to be fine. We are going to be fine if we take care of each other because taking care of the climate and the weather and the planet is taking care of uh, us, uh, all of us. And uh, it's not about uh, you and us. No, it's, it's all of us that we have to be involved in this well, era. Yeah, so the, the, and there's all that human suffering that we've been talking about from climate change, but there's also the cost. So in 2017, wildfires and hurricanes and to a lesser degree, flooding and drought cost people in the United States over $306 billion. Wow. These dollars of, you know, what it costs to deal with these climate disasters are getting very real. Who pays for that? Well, it goes into the overall general pool and to ultimately taxpayers pay for it the individuals who are, mm -hmm. whose home has been carried away by a hurricane, mm -hmm. they pay for it. In California, because of so many wildfires, people can no longer get fire insurance. You know, so all of these cascading effects are hitting people in different areas in yes. different ways. Yes, yes. Um, time, time goes very quickly, it was very, uh... <laughs> Educational, this interview, I, I enjoy it. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sommer. I really appreciate uh, you accept my invitation. Uh, you open uh, our minds to, to everybody. Um, would you like to add something uh, to, to your experience and uh, your life? Whatever you want to say is fine. Well, um, like you mentioned earlier with the people in Bangladesh not having you know, more than a three day supply of food. There are many ways in which the wealthy countries like the United States have more resilience, have more infrastructure to deal with the impact of climate. 
in the United States, people are perhaps more able to rebuild a home if it gets mm -hmm. destroyed by a hurricane. Yeah. Um, but many parts of the world do not have that infrastructure and that systematic resilience to deal with climate disasters. And so again, we need to help these people in other countries with the, the knowledge, the helping them with building their infrastructure, helping them with building their resilience, and also taking their wisdom. In some cases, the old farming techniques in some of those countries are part of the solution. We need to listen to them as well and take the best of what they know yes. and help it to be implemented worldwide. So it's a matter of getting everybody to think yes. about how can I lower my personal carbon footprint as much as possible? How can I work to help others yes. to lower their carbon footprints? And how can we do this all together in a way that doesn't leave anybody falling through the cracks, that doesn't leave anybody behind? Because when people are devastated by climate change and they have nowhere to go, it can, it can lead to very, very bad outcomes, including things that have been going on in Africa, things yeah. that have been going on in the Middle East, like the Syrian war. I don't know, many people don't know that really it was the drought of 2007 through 2010 that caused 1.5 million farmers to flee the land, move into the cities, the cities that were already full of Iraqi war refugees. The government could not support the people fleeing to the cities. Yeah. They cut, they cracked down on protests. Half the Syrian army defected to form the Free Syrian Army. And that was the start of the Syrian war, basically triggered by climate change. So we, we need to help people everywhere to avoid these kinds of disastrous outcomes. Yes, yes. Well, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sommer. I really appreciate the interview. Uh, you open our minds and, and see things more clear now. Um, there are so many topics to, when we decide to talk about climate change. Uh, one of the topics that really uh, feel, uh, feel at home, I am originally from Peru, as I mentioned before, you um, we also have uh, a lot of people to have over there. We have the El Niño. We could we'll take that subject, El Niño, for a different program. I will really appreciate. Yeah. Thank you so much for participating in this interview, Dr. Sommer. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Enrique. Thank, Thank you. you See you next time. Thank you.